Hi, I'm Mark Rush Jr., partner at Prodigy Search. As part of our Prodigy Search Presents interview series, we're speaking with a few members of our DEI Board of Advisors as they play a major role advocating for change within their organizations and within the sports and entertainment industry as well. Our goal with this mini-series is brief 15-20 minute conversations to continue to educate and provide guidance to sports and entertainment leaders as our DEI Board members share valuable insights and best practices. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce Pam Wheeler. Pam, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me. So Pam's background includes various stops at the Women's National, National Basketball Players Association, the Continental Basketball Association, and even a few years at the NFL. She serves as a lecturer at Columbia University at the present and also held board roles with the U.S. Center for Safe Sport and Women's Sports Foundation throughout her career. She's presently Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at NFB, which we'll get into a little bit later in the conversation. Um, but before we jump into that, let's go backwards. So, Pam, let's start our conversation with the past. And um, I've joked with our other DEI board members. I remember having a conversation with Natalie Rogers, and I said, you were doing DEI work before it was cool, back in the 90s, right? And, and, and Natalie started laughing. But the reality of it is she was doing this for in the tennis world for the USTA, um, you know, as part of her duties and responsibilities 20 plus years ago. So I ask you in a similar context before 2020, before a lot of the last few years, when you were working with, with in women's basketball, collective bargaining, um, overall leadership and, and guidance you provided to WNBA players a long time ago, what were the key areas of focus? What were your key, you know, big wins early in your career with, with women's basketball? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, I've been creating spaces for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in my entire career. It's just now that there's a name for it. Um, <laughs> even, anybody, you know, seriously, though, when even when I was at the WNBPA, I think there was a recognition that a good amount of our work was um, involved um, multicultural diversity, um, obviously gender equity, gender inclusion, um, um, sexual orientation inclusion, um, sexual identity inclusion. And then, of course, a number of our, most of our players play internationally, right? And we had international players. So again, there was that multi multicultural dimension as well. So I think there was a recognition of it. I think we just, like you said, we didn't sort of label it that way. Yeah. Uh, and so some of our, you know, initial issues were when you, when, you know, when you think about it, you think about the WNBA and DEIB work is about changing systems and cultures. And when you think about the WNBA, it really was a league that was created to be a almost like a carbon copy of a men's league. Right. right? And so, um, and initially the NBA slash WNBA ran it that way. They ran it utilizing the same systems and cultures that they use for the men's league. And it was, you know, became quite apparent early that that just wasn't going to work. So it's very similar to the DEIB work that we're talking about now, which is, you know, we're trying to allow for different cultures, identities, um, ethnicities, et cetera, to exist within cultures that were quite frankly designed to keep straight white men in power. Yeah. So, um, you know, so that was the first hurdle, which was, you know, how do we distinguish and create those opportunities for equity and inclusion for WNBA players? And I remember we were one of the first organizations, I think nationwide, to even have same-sex um, partner health benefits, right? So, you know, the, now that's commonplace, but at that's that time, huge. But at that time, that was huge. That was that was new. Yeah. Yeah, it was very new. So. Um, you know, so those were some of our earlier wins were really about distinguishing the WNBA um, as an entity that needed to be treated equitably, treated differently, but at the same time created, uh, treated fairly. I think about the um, how far women's sports have come and and there's still work to be done, obviously, so I'm not naive to it. But, you know, the, the question I have is rooted in just that. Look, I, I, I did a search. I did an executive search for for the WNBA league office 15 years ago. And I'll tell you that the league offices look different. The teams and the franchises look different. So there's a lot of, and, and again, different in a good way, in a positive way, and especially as expansions on the horizon. Obviously the uh, current leadership regime is doing a very good job there. How far has the WNBA come since your time with the PA? I mean, I'm curious about just kind of broadly, and, and maybe even more women's sports. You don't need to, it depends on where you want to go with the answer here. Uh, think about the NWSLs and, and the soccer front. So, you know, it's been, you know, over the last 5, 10, 15 years, like how far has, you know, again, women's basketball, if you want to stay there, or just women's sports in general, how far have they come? Well, obviously, the, I think the the product is definitely um, 
increased and enhanced, which it should, right? I mean, I think we see that in all sports. I don't think that's very different. But I also think um, that there's a greater recognition now that there needs to be a connection between the the emotional connection and the economic connection, understanding that um, this it is a business and that players need to be paid. Um, and I, I recall over the last few months, obviously the um, horrible situation with Brittany Griner, and, and what happened with her, and you know, sort of the backlash was, why do the players have to play overseas? And and every time I would, someone would say that to me, I'd ask them, well, when is the last time you bought a ticket to a game, right? I mean, what do you, <laughs> fair you know, response, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm like, what do you expect them to get paid in Monopoly money? I mean, yeah, you know, so there's this emotional connection, and and that it. The WNBA represents this great social value, but we got to start putting our economic connection to it. And when you start talking about other sports, I challenge other sports uh, sponsors and television um, broadcasters, not just television anymore, right? So you can watch a game in different formats now um, or enjoy a game in different formats now. But, you know, I challenge them to put their money where their mouths are. If they value um, women's sports, then support them, um, become sponsors. Uh, buy tickets, you know, butts and seats matter. Um, yeah. Audio television matter. And so I, 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 I'm seeing that progression and I like that. And I, I think one of the things that we're most proud of is that uh, we, we knew initially that none of the players and the players knew it and we knew it that none of the players that we were negotiating that first collective bargaining agreement for were going to get rich playing yeah. in the WNBA. But what, what our intention was, was to create a system by which when the WNBA becomes wildly successful, which I know it's going to be, um, that the players could reap the rewards from that. Yeah. The emotional, the comment you made there, I mean, it's such a great definition uh, and, and, and understanding on the business. I mean, I think about it the same way, right? Whether you're a season, whether you're looking to buy tickets, uh, where you're looking to be a sponsor, don't look at these leagues or these teams as a charity case, right? The emotional, like you said, the, the emotional move past that and, you're doing social good and community. Like this isn't like a donation. Right? No, like going going to a game or investing as a sponsor because you believe it's real. Uh, you believe you you care about it. Um, you're a true fan or you're a true partner if you're a sponsor. You're not just throwing money at it because it looks good on Twitter when you say we're partner of the NBA, right? You're doing it because there's a real long term value and hopefully business value, right? I mean, not not the I want to ignore the community and, and the emotional, by the way, and the chat. Those are all great things, by the way. But like, let's let's treat this. Let's not let's not treat it any different as if we're a fan or a partner. That that's a great point you made. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the same. You know, when you think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, diversity is representation, right? It's just, it's sort of, it's numbers. It's um, whatever demographic a person falls in. Inclusion is valuing that demographic. There's a reason why it's important for me to have women on my board. There's a reason why it's important for me to have um, Asian people, Latina people, LGBTQ+, military veteran, disabled people, on my executive team because that increases innovation of thought, increases our revenues, increases our opportunities to enter into markets that we probably wouldn't enter into before. So that's the inclusion part. So we we value that that, um, diversity. The equity part is treating it fairly. So it's, yeah. it's the same reason. It's the same rationale for why women get paid seven or eight cents on a dollar, why women of color get paid five to six cents on a dollar, because you believe, you know, every the companies are saying they believe in diversity. Great. Um, I, be, I, I believe there's value in it, but I don't want to pay you as much. Right. So yeah. I'm not paying you as much. I'm not paying the women as much as I'm paying the men. So that's the equity part. So the same thing with the WNBA and with women's sports. You you believe in it. Every, every time you speak to someone, like you said, everyone thinks WNBA is great. It represents great social value. Um, it re- represents women's empowerment. All of these things, a way for fathers to, and daughters to connect in a way that they couldn't before, possibly, but then you don't want to pay them the same amount. Well, then yeah. that's 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 inequitable. Is there? Um, this is like I'm. Uh, you could tell I'm not. A prof- I'm, a, I'm an interviewer in my day job as a recruiter, but I'm not a professional <laughs> interviewer. So I'm kind of leading the interview here. I'm leading the witness of, as if I was a lawyer here. Um, but but your, what you said there is where I'm going. Are are the I and the B? I'm, I'm getting in the letters right, so I'm parsing a little bit here, but. The inclusion and belonging part of the puzzle. Are we at a, are we at a stage now? 
to where there's not enough emphasis on the inclusion of belonging pieces in your or or maybe not maybe I'm over overreacting or but but are they, are they overlooked or not is there not enough attention played to to inclusion and belonging? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, you know, when we talk about <clears throat> excuse me, when you talk about the diversity piece, obviously, again, that's the representation. The inclusion part is valuing that representation. The equity part is treating that 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 piece that we value um, equitably, not equally, right? Because everyone doesn't need the same thing. Yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. And then the belonging piece brings it full circle. Yeah. The belonging piece is then empowering those people to be successful and not just empowering your internal folks, but in turn, empowering your stakeholders, your community people, your um, your clients, your partners, your vendors, empowering them to now be successful. Because the inclusion piece doesn't mean you empowered them. It just means that you feel that you're that you feel that they bring some value to the table. But right. what have you done to make them powerful at the table? What have you done yeah. to give them an actual seat at the table where they feel comfortable and actually saying, okay, this company makes me feel like I belong and now I'm empowered to impact the business and empowered to make myself better. Yeah. It, it's um it, it's it's fascinating. And I and I am thank you for for that answer. I, I didn't know if if practitioners felt the same way we did, which is it's great you can have the diversity. And, and look, that's it's not the not focus on any of those those things, but if you're just focused on diversity and there's other aspects of this whole conversation you're ignoring, well, then you're just getting representation. Great, you're hiring somebody, or you have a vendor that is is uh, or a partner um, that might be a black or woman owned business. But then, are you doing again? Is the equity is the included? Is it, if there's other things that are missing, well, you check. I hate to say, drink off one of the boxes. There's still like three or four other ones that are remaining kind of empty, and you're like, all right, well. It looks good for optics, but they're not sitting in on the meetings at the, at the table uh, right. or it's not a real vendor, not treated the same as every other vendor or partner. Um, so I just was, I didn't know if that was my take and that's, you know, one perspective or if you feel like that's a common thing. So thank you for expanding on that. No problem. Um, can I, we, we, we've talked about with our, our DEI board and you've been a part of that where for organizations that are that are either starting a, a DEI initiative, whether it's sports entertainment or not, doesn't matter. It could be outside of sports entertainment, media, uh, Fortune five, Fortune five hundred, Fortune thousand, uh, nonprofits. Whether they're starting a DEI initiative or they're looking to better organize or streamline their their initiatives, the notion of some sort of like DEI toolkit or DEI repository of where there's information, there's a um, there's a structure, there's a process. Can you talk about that that idea? Whether it's an organization starting uh, a DEI uh, um, uh, program, or they're looking to uh, better organize and better plan. The idea of some again a toolkit or or, or central centralized structure. To, Here's how you do it, like a game plan. Like talk about that notion of of the needing to organize and um, and kind of bring it all together, so it doesn't seem disjointed. Talk, can you talk about that? Yeah, I think if if you're looking at DEIB from a business and imperative standpoint, which is the way we we view it. Yeah. Um, you would treat it no differently than you would treat any other business imperative, right? You'd have a strategy, you'd have a vision, you'd have a strategy and a way to drive it, and then a way to measure it and make sure that you're meeting those goals. And so I think that toolkit, I'm not sure I, I you know, toolkit just kind of means we're going to throw out a couple of points and we want you to <laughs> sort of uh, make sure you follow those. But if you're talking about a vision and a strategy and then how to drive that and then, again, account for it then I agree with you. I think that that's yeah. what we should be doing. And But again, it's really, you know, and I speak to a lot of our clients in particular about how they want to start DEIB initiatives. And one of the first things I ask them is, why are you doing it? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing you need to ask yourself is, why are you doing it? Um, and then for me, again, it's about changing systems and cultures. It's not about yeah. programs. It's about how do we actually create systemic and cultural long lasting impact. Yeah. We, I mean, I theoretically, I should talk myself out of a job in five years, right there. I, I shouldn't have a job <laughs> in five years. So, um, you know, the notion of we'll just buy some tickets to luncheons and we'll just yeah, 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 you know, we'll yeah. support, uh, that's, that's not gonna create um, yeah. impact at all. 
Well, look, your your how you describe that, I think, is valid and, and the approach and, and, and whether again, my, my point in saying the toolkit is more of a, hey, is there a foundation for it, right? To say, hey, don't ignore this because it needs to be holistic, right? And, and to your point, it needs to be it needs to be kind of this overarching and 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 strategic. Um, the leader who's creating it or the leaders need to have the vision for it to be a long term. But again, I, I say toolkit, and that's a phrase or a word, but more in that there's a holistic approach. We're not ignoring three or four or five different tentacles to this. Again, vendor, community, not just we have a good pipeline through HBCUs, right? And okay, great. We're, that's that's helpful. That's that's a strategy. Um, but that's not, to your point, it needs to be this kind of everybody buying into uh, long-term change. I hope you're not out of a job in five years, Pam. But but I I know I understand what you're saying that, look, you've set it up to where they don't need you to be leading and, and reminding and guiding every single day. The organization has already made that change or changes, plural, so. Um, Sorry, you went in and out a little bit. Can you repeat that? Yeah, so it was more, it was more of just a, a comment on, I, I think I agree with how you approached this from a holistic perspective and long-term visionary perspective, not a quick fix, quick flip, great, we're throwing money at it, or we're throwing a, a guest speaker at it, or we're changing something on our website, that it's this long-term, and again, hopefully it outlasts your tenure there, um, but not for bad reasons other than <laughs> you've success. So that, that's all. Um I, I, I want to talk about two other things about your background and, and, and kind of want to wrap it with these things. So so back in 2019, you started a nearly two year run as a consultant for the NFL, focusing on leadership and DEI advisement. Where did you provide them with some guidance? Not down the specifics and things that are confidential, but where did you come in and provide them with some guidance and support? In the NFL football operations um, department under Troy Vincent's group. And so I started there with um, helping them with some leadership on a couple of, on a few of people that were sort of um, high potential um, folks who they saw a great potential in and knew that they would uh, be ascending to leadership. And so I worked individually with them. And then of course, 2020 happened and um, they wanted to do, um, you know, they wanted to obviously increase what they were doing, just like any, you know, just like every everyone else sure. in 2020 after George Floyd. And it was the, you know, how do we actually do this intentionally and do it the right way? And and one yeah. of the things that I not, I think one of the good things that happened um at that time was people were actually um recognizing their vulnerability and their yeah. inability to get this right. I mean, in 2018, you couldn't necessarily say. I'm not doing diversity right. I'm not doing inclusion right. I mean, yeah. you sort of would have been, you know, looked at as a pariah if you had said that. Right. 2020, I think it opened up the world for people to say, I can raise my hand here and say, I have a good, I have a good intentions, but I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. And I need a better, and I need a strategy for this. I need, yeah. a, I need to look at this the way I look at other aspects of my business. Again, what we were talking about before, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because I need to do it better. And so um, I think that, you know, they were no different and I was able to help them in some ways sort of put together some um, some preliminary groundwork there. Well, and to that end, to that to the point of vulnerability, look, the thought crossed our mind when we conducted a few DEI searches that, that inside of sports entertainment, that maybe external sports entertainment, um, you know, DEI had been done a little bit longer or a little bit better, or if not a lot better, a lot longer. Um, so, so to that end, my, my final question is really simple. So two years ago, nearly two years ago, I think, um, so coming up on the anniversary of that, uh, you made the transition out of sports to serve as Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for NFP. Um, they're one of the leading insurance brokers and benefits and retirement consultants in, in the industry. Um, and, and so I look at a role like that saying, what, where did they what did they task you with? Like, where did they need your help, or where do you where do you feel you could still deliver results for the organization? So NFP was no different, right? So NFP is like um, there was some work done prior to when I got there, and they were it was focused on DNI, um, but there wasn't again an enterprise wide strategy, and so I was brought in to actually create an enterprise wide global strategy for NFP across the organization. And so our vision now is to create those systems and cultures of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging that permeate every aspect of the business. Um, and when I talk about permeating every aspect of the business, not just internally, um, of course, it's very important. We're a people first company, 
but it's also about how do we create those opportunities where we are providing better services, better products, being a better partner for our clients. How do our client teams look better? How do we then again into potentially enter into markets that we weren't able to enter into before? How do we actually, how are we actually a better, we're a privately held company. Um, how do we become a better investment for yeah. our investors, right? Because we're a diversity, um, equitable, inclusive company where people feel like they belong. So, and how do we increase, um, I created a supplier diversity program when I came to NFP. How do we not just increase our number of suppliers, but then how do we become a better partner for them? How do we create opportunities for MBEs or WMBEs to be successful and within the PNC business? How do we, um, within our corporate benefits business, how do we actually help our clients to become more competitive, right? Because people are looking at the benefits that they're that their potential employers offer. And so we have to go through now and, and make sure that their benefits are diverse, equitable, inclusive, um, and, and help make our, our clients better. So we are looking at it definitely from a business perspective of not just creating opportunities, of course, for DEIB programming, but how do we make our people better? How are we more, how are we meeting our underrepresented populations better? How are we creating opportunities for underrepresented people to enter the industry? I mean, there's no eight-year-old kid sitting at home right now going, oh, when I grow up, I want to be an insurance broker, right? So, <laughs> I mean, and it's certainly not any, you know, any Black kids or any Latino <laughs> kids sitting around going, oh, when I grow up, I want to be an insurance right, broker. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, you know, how do we, how do we make not only the industry a better employment destination, but how do we bring in those underrepresented um, you sort of uh, people to understand that this is an employment? opportunity for them you know and we're talking about sports right everyone talks about um everyone talks about guaranteed contracts you don't think owners actually pay those things right somebody yeah, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> you know yeah. so, so you know insurance and undertakers are always going to be needed well i love that you how you describe it though because the, the broader word you know look it's, it's about educating and informing and that, that and that could be you know the example you said you want future people to work for nfp um that don't look like me and that's all right um and then that that, that, that you know, there's work to be done there but education more broadly internally about the initiatives externally with your suppliers uh there's no certain on turn in your current role which i really love i mean the fact that there's you know, there's, you know, I think roles like yours, and I've talked with people that have these positions, some people we've placed in similar roles where the value is that they're not being excluded from to your prior role, football operations, or they're not being excluded from HR or finance, that it's this all inclusive, um, you know, that you can be part of the of those conversations, just so, you know, nobody's being, um, you know, nobody thinks they're, they're better than or not part of the DEI conversation. That's incredibly important. So, um, I know you have a, a, a big task ahead. Hopefully, uh, despite what you said, you do have a job at NFP in five years, but I understand why you said that. Look, if you've accomplished everything you have, uh, I won't be calling you in five years if you've done your job. But nonetheless, uh, I love the background. I love what you did prior to your current role. Um, and, and again, you've been doing this for, for a very long time before it was um, kind of the cool thing to do or before people study, started having jobs like this. You did it when um, you know, when it was needed for back in women's basketball um, and to where you are today in the corporate sector. So, um, Pam, thank you so much for your, your time today. Thank you so much for your efforts on our DEI board. I cannot thank you enough. And, and to our audience, uh, look for this on our podcast platforms. Uh, and please keep an eye on what Pam is doing in terms of her company and more importantly, in other industries, both sports and entertainment and beyond. So, Pam, thank you and continued success. Thank you, Mark. I'm always happy to help you. <laughs>